Okay, let's pray and then we're going to get right back into 1 Samuel chapter 23. And you remember that we've entitled this, Who is My Neighbour? And uh, we'll, we'll uh, see how that links into what we said before in a few moments. Let's pray. Father, I don't know about uh, other people, Lord, but I feel quite tired and weary. And imagine lots of folk here are finding it difficult to think of anything other than what's coming up in the next 10 days or news that we've just heard that has been unsettling. Father, I pray now that we would be refreshed by your spirit and that you would be showing us things that will serve us well in the days ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so you remember we read 1 Samuel chapter 23 and uh, you may still be wondering quite what that has to do with what we then moved on to because I asked you a cluster of questions. What do you think God thinks is the most important thing? What does your church say God thinks is the most important thing? What does your church show? And what would your non-Christian neighbours looking at you or me doing life, what would they think we think is top priority? And then we segued into the discussion between Jesus and the religious teacher and he's asking, how do I have a great life? And Jesus asks him to summarise the law, which he does. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And melding to that, not a separate one to that, but part of that, love your neighbour as you love yourself. And the man is obviously challenged by the second part of that because he says, who is my neighbour? And Jesus responds by telling him what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, I would suggest that 1 Samuel chapter 23 is almost like a training DVD on loving your neighbour. It's almost as though God, in high definition, and Dolby 5 One Surround Sound, is saying, this is what happens often when you love your neighbour. So all I wanted to look at was one thing in the next half hour or so, and it's this, what were the repercussions that flowed from David seeking to love his neighbour? In verse 1 of chapter 23, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, that was a city, and are looting the th threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, Go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. So that's what he decides to do. What is the first repercussion? I don't know if you spotted this as we read through it. The first repercussion is majority disagreement. Most people thought this was a stupid idea. So 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 3, David's inquired of the Lord. The Lord's told him to go and get involved with these people. He doesn't know. Uh, he doesn't have any relationship with them. It's just a nearby city, and he finds out that they're, they're being attacked, just like the man on the road to Jericho. And, and he, he's deciding to go, verse 3, but David's men... Now, just trust me on this. Later on, we discover there are 600 of them, all right? So David's men said to him, here in Judah, we are afraid... How much more if we go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? Their argument is, this is a stupid idea. This idea of us leaving the place where we are secure, the cave of Adullam, where we feel reasonably safe, we're in our comfort zone, we all know who sits where. Everything is sliced and diced. We feel great. Now you've come up with this crazy idea that we go and get involved with people. We don't know them. We have no relationship with them. And you're telling us to go and rescue them. And, and they give a very good argument why they shouldn't go. The first argument they give is the Philistines. You know, they've just escaped 
from the Philistines. David has been over to the land of the Philistines. That's one of the chapters that we uh, just jumped over. And he has escaped from the city of Gath and he's gone back to Judah. So we've just got away from the Philistines and now you're coming up with the stupid idea that, that, that we go and fight them. Keilah was a border town. It was between Judah and the land of the Philistines. And there was lots of debate and argument about who it belonged to. Half the time it belonged to Judah, half the time it belonged to the Philistines. And so David is now putting his men in grave danger because they're going to come against much, much larger Philistine forces. We are going to attract enemy fire if we go and get involved with our neighbours. The second argument that they bring, uh, or, or that's implied in the text, is we are going to blow our cover as far as Saul is concerned. Saul doesn't know where we are. Saul has not yet located us in the cave of Adullam. But if we go into the city of Keilah, we will be easy meat for Saul. Because Keilah was a walled city with barred windows and gates. And once you got in, you couldn't get out easily. So 1 Samuel 23 verse 7 reads this way. Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. And he, Saul, said, listen to Saul using spiritual language, God has handed him over to me, for David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. And Saul called up all of his forces for battle to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. This might surprise you, but I guarantee if you go back to your church and however you do it and wherever you do it, you say, here's a radical idea. Why don't we move out of our comfort zone and really get involved in loving our neighbours? And it might surprise you how many of the spiritual ones say, we don't think this is a great idea. We've enough problems as it is without getting involved with that lot out there. Now you see exactly the same thing with the followers of Jesus in the New Testament. I wonder if you've noticed how often the disciples and Jesus seem to be singing from a different hymn sheet. They're not on the same page at all. And quite often Jesus has to rebuke his disciples. Let me just run some scenarios past you. So here's a man, and we've looked at this man before, here's a man born blind from birth which he would be if he was born blind, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Born blind, blind from birth. And, uh, and, and the guy stood there, what are the disciples doing? They're discussing theology with Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I mean, what a stupid discussion to have in front of a guy who's blind. And Jesus, you remember, dismisses the argument and says this has happened so that the glory of God might be revealed. Let's get involved in helping this guy, not involved in theologically discussing where his problems come from. Or you have the situation where Jesus and his disciples have gone to the other side of the, the lake, the Sea of Galilee, because they need a rest. And then to their horror, thousands of people turn up. 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So if congregations then were anything like now, this is a big crowd of people. What do the disciples say? Get rid of them. They start telling Jesus what to do. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. Or there are times when people are bringing children to Jesus, that he might take them in his arms and bless them, and the disciples are telling them to get the kids away from Jesus. Or you have the situation when they're walking along one day and there are two guys who are blind and they're calling out to Jesus and the disciples are telling them to shut it. Hey, pal, silence. It is incredible how often the disciples are not on the same page as Jesus when it comes to helping people. Because they have realised if we get involved with them, that is more work for us, that is a nightmare, things are not going to keep going as we would like them to go. Now, it's very easy for me to, to bang on about this stuff and not realise that, that probably I would have responded exactly the same way. 
Yeah, I, I'm imagining when, before you came to Cape and Ray, you got an email or some kind of, you know, text or something saying, Bible school begins on such and such a day at such and such a time. Please do not turn up before whatever, okay? Just imagine that there are a fleet of buses coming down the drive here with not just you guys on board, but 5,000 other people on board. I mean, how do you think the reception would have responded if you turned up a week early, 5,000 of you? I'm sure they would have said this is a tremendous privilege and we're so overwhelmed at the opportunity, blue light flashing, we're so overwhelmed at the opportunity of blessing you a minute. No, they did, everybody would be getting antsy and didn't you read the flipping emails and, and all the rest of it. That's how we operate. So very, very often, the majority of us, if the truth be told, are not that thrilled about loving our neighbours. So here is a, a bit of a suggestion. Be really careful of assuming that if you have a vote about something in your church, the vote will be the will of God. I'm kind of reading into the text here, but let's just imagine that David's having a vote and he looks at his soldiers and says, okay, okay guys, here's the proposition. The proposition is that we go and help the citizens of Keilah. We love our neighbours. Those in favour, Zippo, Nada, nothing. Those against, 600 hands go up. And then David announces... The yeses have it. We're going to help the citizens of Keilah. And I can imagine somebody coughing and saying, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think you meant the noes have it. And he says, no, I didn't mean that. I meant the yeses have it. Democracy, as far as I can see, looking at the Bible, is not a brilliant way of discovering the will of God. You know why? Because in any group, usually speaking, the immature outnumber the mature. Hello? So, so, I don't know how your church is governed. There are essentially three different models of church government in the New Testament. Maybe Derek's looked at this, and if he has, it'll just be uh, a little bit of, of uh, Groundhog Day. But let me just remind you the three kinds of ways of making decisions that we find in the New Testament. And I want you to see which of these is nearest to how your church makes decisions. Okay, the first uh, illustration, or the first uh, one, would be what I'm calling congregational involvement. You might want to write that down. Where the whole church is involved in making a decision. And I guess the, the clearest illustration of that in the New Testament would be Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I'd write that down, or you won't remember it in 10 seconds, let alone in five years. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Acts 6, verses 1 through 7 is where there is a problem in the early church. You remember in the early church that, that people, if they had property which they didn't need, would sell it. If they had land that they didn't need, they'd sell it. And they would bring the resources generated by that and lay it at the feet of the apostles. And that money, those resources were turned into food and clothes, etc. And it says that they were then distributed amongst the people of God, amongst the church. And the first argument in the book of Acts is between the Greek-speaking Jews and the Aramaic-speaking Jews because the Greek-speaking widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of, of goods and food and all the rest of it. And so, here is what the apostles say in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, speaking to the church. Brothers, you, plural, choose from among yourselves seven men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, this saying pleased the entire group. And they chose, and it lists seven men. And then verse 6 of Acts chapter 6, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So there you have an illustration of the whole church being involved in making a decision. But can I point something out to you? Th they were not loose cannons making a decision. 
The parameters, the guidelines for the decision were given by the apostles. Choose seven. Choose seven, in their situation, men. Choose seven men who were obviously full of the Holy Spirit. And then when you guys have chosen them, bring them to us. And the idea there is that, that we need to be happy with the uh, choice as well. And if we are, we'll lay our hands on them and pray for them. Congregational involvement. Can I just suggest, I don't know what your church is like, but I, when I became a Christian, I joined a Baptist church, and I'm not knocking the Baptist church. Thank God for that church that I was part of. But we had members meetings all the flipping time about everything. And it was like pushing a boulder up a hill. You know, I don't know if you've been in members meetings where you're discussing endless things. It's like throwing a bone amongst a pack of dogs. Everybody and their grandmother's got an opinion about everything. You know, so we want to paint this wall behind the pulpit. Let's get all the congregation together to discuss what colour it is. That is a recipe for a riot. It is a recipe for nothing being done because everybody has an opinion. And I wanted to say when I was a pastor, here's a brilliant idea. The only people who are allowed to give an opinion about what colour that wall should be painted are people who are interior designers. How is that for an idea? So congregational involvement. Uh, I think there is a place for that, but I don't think it's the major way of making decisions that we see in the Bible at all. The second method is the other extreme to that. That is individual decision making. So the first one was the entire congregation. The next is a strong individual making decisions. Now, uh, I found in, in many kind of vibrant, radical, avant-garde churches today, it is often now a couple, the, pa the, the pastor and his wife, who are the point leaders, who actually make, if the truth be known, most of the decisions. I don't know what you think about that. At least you get decisions made. The problem is they are made by, you know, by somebody with gifts, but not all the gifts. It seems to me in the New Testament that the norm is not congregational decision-making, and it's not individualistic decision-making in the New Testament, and I'm sure Derek will or already has looked at this. It is a plurality of leadership. In established churches in the New Testament, again and again and again and again and again, it talks about the elders, plural. And so here's my suggestion for when you get into leadership. I know right now you're not going to go home and take over your church, maybe not for another 15 or 20 years, but when you are in leadership, I would encourage you to try and meld those three models and to say there is a place for strong individual leadership. Most growing churches have one or two strong leaders, Rick Warren's Saddleback, Bill Hybels, Community Church in Chicago, Willow Creek, and on and on and on and on and on. People often talk of an individual leader. But I would encourage you to try and model, yes, taking things to a congregation, if it's a huge, major, big deal, but not taking all sorts of trivial things to everybody and their grandmother. I think it's important to notice what David does. David is wise, he isn't arrogant. If you look again at 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, he inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, Go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. All of his soldiers object. We can't take on the Philistines. Now they don't say it, but the text implies it. It would be suicide militarily to go into a closed city. Saul's going to find out and attack us. So what's the next thing that David does? Look at verse 4. Once again, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered him, Go down to Keilah, for I'm going to give the Philistines into your hand. So the first thing you can expect in most churches, if you talk about really loving other people, 
is most people will not think that's a great idea. They're thinking they'll pray about it and they'll pray for a revival that will cause it. But when you say, how about us getting doing it, you'll find that many, many people don't think it's a great idea. I think I shared with this, this with you once before. But if you think that democracy is the way to make decisions in the church of Jesus Christ, wait until you've got kids and then try running your home with kids on a democratic, democratic basis. So Sunday night, say to the kids, who thinks school's a great idea tomorrow morning? Who thinks making your bed in the morning is a great idea? Who thinks keeping your room tidy is a great idea? And you will not get an overwhelming majority. Because remember what I said, in a big crowd of people, the immature usually outnumber the mature significantly. Here's the second consequence. Massive disruption. David goes and God uses him to deliver the city of Keilah from the Philistines, but then Saul hears about it. And Saul comes with armed men against David. Look at what it says in verse 13 of 1 Samuel chapter 23. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. We didn't read all those places mentioned from about verse 13 down to the end of the, of the chapter. It's lots of unpronounceable places. But if you were to get a Bible atlas... David is going further and further and further into the wilderness, into deserts. They're hiding out in forests. It is a nightmare. Now, he has 600 men, but what it doesn't tell us in chapter 23, that we'll find out later on, as, as we read through 1 Samuel, is that many of those men, including David, had more than one wife. And they also had... Lots of them, lots of kids. So here's the next problem for David when he now goes to help his neighbours in Keilah. You either have got to cart all the wives and all the kids around with you. Think about when you went on holiday. Maybe you can remember when you're in the back of the car and you're driving somewhere on holiday. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Have we got there yet? How much further is it? I'm getting fed up with this. Mary's thrown up in the back. Imagine... <laughs> dragging hundreds of women and hundreds of kids around the kind of places that are listed at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 23. It is a flipping nightmare. Once we start being involved in caring for people around where we live, guess what? It disrupts our nice, neat little plans. Um, I watched a while ago, let, let me just read verse 14 and then I'll, I'll tell you. I watched a while ago, let me read verse 14 and then I'll tell you. 1 Samuel 23, <laughs> 1 Samuel 23 verse 14. David stayed in the desert strongholds and in the hills of the deserts of Ziph. This, this is really scary territory. Um, th there's a book, if you haven't read it and you're into really great, uh, war books, it's, it's called Bravo to Zero. And it was written by a guy who led an SAS group of soldiers in the first Gulf War. These guys were, were dropped, uh, and it, it was kind of a, a, an, a, a, an illustration of how brave British soldiers can be, but how inept the planning of the government can be. Because this SAS group were dropped in the middle of Iraq, but they were actually dropped in the middle of the Iraqi army. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't make it up. They, they parachute in and they find themselves quite literally in the middle of the Iraqi army. So they're actually hiding in a little, in a little uh, valley and a, and a cave in the, in the side of the valley. 
Also, some genius in the British government had seen Iraq summer blistering heat. So these guys were dressed like they were going on holiday to Spain or something. Nobody had told them that the temperatures at night were sub-zero. So these guys are in freezing conditions at night. Also, somebody had given them the wrong frequencies if they were going to signal for help on their radios. The frequencies they got were, were signaling nobody particular. So, these guys are hiding out in this little cave and the Iraqi army, not looking for them particularly, but, but, are, but are moving towards them, closing in. And there's a little boy who's looking for his sheep and he's gone down into the valley looking for the sheep and he sees these British soldiers. So he, you know, uh, metaphorically blows the whistle on them and the Iraqi army starts moving towards them. They're a very small group. Of, of SAS trained soldiers. So what they decide to do is to charge at the Iraqi army, which was fantastic. And they punched their way through. I think a couple of them were killed and they, they, they escape and now they're on the run with, with you know, everybody looking for them. Every one of them was caught. They weren't, they weren't killed when they were captured. They were later released in exchanges for Iraqi soldiers who'd been captured. But one of them, a guy called Chris Ryan, escaped. He actually got back to the military base. And he's written a book called The One That Got Away. It's incredible. And he was kind of living or hiding in, in sewage pipes when the guys are coming looking for him. He climbed down under the road, climb into a sewage pipe. The only water he can drink. When he got back to base, all his teeth fell out because the water he was drinking was the cooling water from, from nuclear processing plants. He didn't know that. And he gets away, a really brilliant, tough guy. Well, now let's fast forward about 10 years, and he's doing a program on British television. And uh, the program was, was interesting. It was basically that he was dropped in some part of the world, you know, dived in on a, on a parachute somewhere, and then two people from the parachute regiment in Britain and three Navy SEALs from the US have got two days to locate him. So he's on the run hiding out like he was when he was in Iraq and these guys are trying to tag him before he gets to the, the rendezvous zone. And it was kind of a, a competition but it was showing you really military techniques. And one time he's in this part of the world, not exactly here but not a million miles from here. And he's hiding out and he's talking to camera and he's in much the same area that David was in, in 1 Samuel chapter 23. And talking to camera, he says, this country is some of the hardest country in the world to survive in. So here is David carting 600 men, hundreds of women, hundreds of kids around as a direct result of loving his neighbours. All right, so result number one, majority think it's a stupid idea. Result number two, my nice, comfy, predictable life is turned upside down. Here's the third consequence. Major disappointment. See, I can just hear right now in lots of churches, we should be doing something to love our neighbours saying things like, well, that won't lead them to Jesus. They'll come for what they can get, but, but when they've got what they can get, they're out of here. And that's absolutely right. Do you remember I told you about the Abundant Life Church in Bradford? And I told you some of the things that they did. I talked about the great Christmas giveaway, where they had a, a Christmas celebration with a snow machine outside the church, and they were giving mountain bikes to kids in the area who didn't get anything for Christmas. And, and I told you about the Cherish Women's Conference they have there, where they were giving uh, gifts to um, little babies who, who, you know, single parents, they were bringing them in. And then the gal who was leading the meeting read out a letter from her mom, do you remember? And it was years ago, and here's this gal who's got pregnant, and she's thinking of getting rid of the child, but Christians encouraged her not to do. And she came to Jesus, and, and the letter she, the, the, the girl's reading, it says, and, and the young woman who's reading this is the baby that I didn't get rid of because of the love of the church. 
Well, that church, which, which pours love and compassion into the neighbourhood, one time they had a, a meeting that was open to everybody in the community. Not the Christmas meeting, another meeting. And everybody in the grandmother came and they have a little break in the middle of the service where they all go, they, ha they literally have a Starbucks uh, coffee shop at the back of the church. So all, all the saints kind of cruise off for a, for a skinny decaf latte, you know, which is a why bother coffee, and they're kind of swigging this down. And they come back, and guess what? All the bags that they've left there have been rifled through. Half of the stuff that was used for the worship group, the mixing desks, disappeared. All the people they invited in to show love had now ripped them all off. Massive disappointment. Well, that's what happens here. 1 Samuel 23, verse 11. David is inquiring of the Lord, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to Saul? When Saul comes along, will they defend me or will they hand me over? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will. Again, David asked, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, they will. That's why David's now a man on the run. Because the people he's helped are now going to stab him in the back and hand him over to Saul. There is a kind of a, a follow-up to the story about the church I told you in Bradford. With all the stuff that got nicked all the purses that got taken, all the computers that got taken out of people's, uh, you know, uh, rucksacks and stuff. The pastor didn't say anything. I mean, he was obviously disappointed. But the word went out on the street to all the people that that church had been helping, all the prostitutes they'd been helping, all the homeless people they'd been helping, all the one-parent families they'd been helping. The word went out on the street, and within two weeks almost everything came back again. And it came back because the mafia out there put pressure on all the people who'd nicked it to hand it back again. I was speaking in a church recently, doesn't matter where it was, in East Lancashire. And uh, when the evening meeting had finished, I'm dry, are some of you going to East Lancashire on, on outreach? You probably are. You might even be going to this church. I'm driving away on the Sunday night and I'm a bit tired, I'm looking forward to getting home. And just at the end of the road, there is a, a zebra crossing, people, you know, striped thing where people walk across. And there's a very pregnant Asian lady stood there, beautiful woman, and, and you know, with a long uh, robe on and stuff. And there are some little kids at her side. And, and so I stopped and, and, and said, you know, please go across the zebra crossing. And so she kind of waved and she walks across and then I hear these two crashes at the side of my car. And I look and there are two other kids who are not her children I found out afterwards but, but were kind of hanging around. And these guys have got balloons full of water and they're hurling them at the side of my car which they think is a laugh. Well, it is a laugh in some ways except that can do a lot of damage. You know, if there's a lot of, if it's really... Um, loads of water in the thing it can actually dent the side of your car and before I realised it I'm not proud of this I am out of my car and I'm chasing these little blighters down the road <laughs> and I think if I get hold of one of those kids I'm going to clatter him you know what's that about that is about when you're kind to somebody and you go out of your way to, to do something to help somebody and then they do something negative back to you it can actually hurt immensely. But I need to remind myself, because I often forget this, there was someone who at immense personal cost came to this planet to help other people with their deep needs, many of whom didn't appreciate what he was doing for them, and many of them whom on that Good Friday were crying, crucify him. Caring for people who rip us off is part of the deal. But here's the final thing before we have a break. The final thing is what I'm calling measurable deliverance. One Samuel twenty three verse five David and his men went to Keilah 
fought the Philistines, carried off their livestock, he inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines, and he saved the people of Keilah. In other words, if you had walked around the streets of Keilah with a questionnaire and said, do you believe in God? Most of those people would have said yes. And if you'd have said, is God interested in you? Most of them would have said yes. And if you said, how do you know? They would have said, because one of God's agents came down our street and sorted out real problems in our life. We know God's there and we know God cares for us because of what David and his men have done in loving their neighbours. Let me, let me read you something. I was hungry and you formed a committee to investigate my hunger. I was homeless and you filed a plight, sorry, and you filed a report on my plight. I was sick and you held a seminar on the situation of the underprivileged. You have investigated all aspects of my plight, but I am still hungry, I am still homeless, and I am still sick. You remember what we're doing in this stuff? We're looking at getting the king out of the boy. We're looking at God putting David through a training program that quite literally on many occasions, almost killed him. But God is building into David and bringing out of David stuff that he would need when he stepped into his destiny. And learning to care for and love and sacrificially be involved in other people's lives is part of the deal. Let me ask you those four or five questions again just in the last couple of minutes. What does God think is the most important thing in the world? What does your church say God thinks is the most important thing in the world? What does your church show by its actions God thinks is the most important thing in the world? And what would your neighbours say you think is top priority as they watch you and me do in life. According to Jesus, most important thing in the world is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as you love yourself. It's quarter to twelve, so let's have a ten minute break and then we'll be good for our final session this morning. Thank you.